Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. This series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. For today's webinar, we're very pleased to be hosting Dr. Kurt Samways, who is a research associate at the University of New Brunswick. Dr. Samways has over 15 years of experience working in aquatic ecology related to natural and impacted river and stream fishes across Canada in both academia and government. He currently leads scientific monitoring of the Fundy National Park Salmon Restoration Program, studying the effects of captive rearing on fish fitness and ecosystem health. He also currently leads the fish passage studies in the Mactaquac Aquatic Ecosystem Study. Dr. Samways has, an, has ongoing collaborations with academia, government, industry, First Nations, and NGOs, as well as being a representative in multiple government and local working groups and committees involved in Atlantic salmon restoration. After the presentation, we'll be opening up the floor for a question and answer session, and you'll have the option of asking your question directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Kurt. Thank you very much, Darla. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, oh, you know, it's always a good opportunity to be able to talk about the work we do. Um, I'd also like to thank you and the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation for funding much of the work that I'm going to be talking uh, talking about today. Without without people and organizations like you, uh, much of this work wouldn't be possible. So yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about um, the project um, that we're working on in fun in Funny National Park. Um, as well as I'll talk about some other rivers that we're also working in um, within the Inner Bay of Fundy. So, what's going on? Can you see the next slide? Not yet, no. <laughs> There we go. All right, so I think I think there's a lot of a lot of people are familiar with Pacific salmon um, in the in the sense they have there's lots of different species. There's five different species of Pacific salmon. Um, the big feature that I want to kind of mention here is that they're semiparous, meaning that they all die after spawning. So there's been a lot of work and a lot of research showing how these large large runs of Pacific salmon, when they come in, they spawn, they die and how important these salmon are to kind of the river ecosystem um, in terms of productivity, in terms of uh, driving not only what's in the river, but also in the terrestrial ecosystems as well. Um, Atlantic salmon are, are you know, quite different. We only have one species here on the East Coast um, and they're iteroparous, meaning they, they're not, they don't die after spawning or most of them don't die after spawning and they can come back uh, multiple times to spawn and that, that spawning strategy, that the ability to come back multiple times, um, is a real key feature for Atlantic salmon, and um, one of the main reasons, or one of the big driving forces in terms of kind of populations and um, uh, you know increasing spawning numbers. Because the large these 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 fish, when they come back, tend to be bigger and bigger and be able to deposit more and more eggs. But Atlantic salmon is is deeply rooted in maritime culture. Um, both with, with the First Nations and the landed immigrants. Um, it was quickly realized that this was a large resource, um, and so it's been exploited for, for quite some time. In Atlantic salmon, it's, it's still extremely important today. Um, you know, angling brings in about $120 million annually. Aquaculture, um, you know, another three, almost $400 million. So really next to, to lobster fishing, um, it is the biggest fishery in New Brunswick. And so we have this, we still have this deep rooted connection. Um, I think there's lots of people that, out there that like to go out and angle for fish, for, for salmon. Uh, it's a great recreational activity, um, as well as it, it is economically very important. It provides a lot of income for and a lot of jobs for a lot of people. So I'm not going to go through the Atlantic salmon life cycle in, in depth. I think most people here are familiar with it. Um, the main thing that I'm, I will stress again is that they do have this ability to come back multiple times. 
um, to spawn. And so today I'm really going to be talking about all, all, all aspects of the Atlantic salmon life cycle. So you'll, be ta you'll hear me talking about returning adults and, and you know, talking about the eggs that they deposit, the, the fry that are out there, the par, um, and those smolts that are leaving to go to sea to grow to come back. So this is just a map of all the inner bay of Fundy rivers. Um, and so there's Fundy National Park. It has two main rivers, uh, the Upper Salmon River, which is where we're doing most of our work, as well it has the Point Wolf River. Um, and you'll see up where it says uh, Moncton, that's the Petacodiac River, of course. Um, that, that river is very important for a lot of reasons, but mainly um, it accounted for about 20 to 25% of all available uh, salmon rearing habitat for the inner Bay of Fundy population. So it's a it's a really key river and uh, one that I'm very proud to say that we are starting to to do some work on there as well. But today I'm going to be focusing mostly on the work that we're doing uh, in Fundy National Park. So what are inner Bay of Fundy Atlantic salmon? Is it Atlantic salmon Atlantic salmon? Um, so typically most Atlantic salmon in North America follow this migratory pattern. So you can see here's a, a, a satellite track of a salmon leaving uh, the Miramichi and makes its way up to Greenland uh, where it overwinters and it will typically make its way back um, to spawn in, in that river. The thing with most, most Atlantic salmon in North America is they have a very significant multi-sea winter component. So as I mentioned, that multi-sea winter component, meaning um, fish that have spawned successfully gone back to the ocean, return back to the ocean to grow and coming back for a second or third or more times. Inner Bay of Fundy salmon are different in the sense that they don't follow that same migratory pattern. So typically we're, when they leave an Inner Bay of Fundy river, they, they'll migrate through the um, Bay of Fundy and into the Gulf of Maine and then returning back to, to their river. So they don't leave this this uh, localized area, unlike the other salmon that go all the way up to Greenland. Um, the other thing is that they are primary, or the majority of them are one sea winter spawners. So they go out as a smolt, they spend one winter, and they come back to spawn. Uh, we don't see a lot of um, uh, multi sea winter fish that are coming back to spawn for their first time. We'll see repeat spawners, but we don't see those fish leaving as a smolt, spending two sea winters, and then coming back to spawn for their first time. So that's um, a little bit unique. Why are Inner Bay of Fundy salmon endangered? Um, I think these graphs um, speak for themselves. Um, unfortunately, they're typical of, of most rivers in Atlantic Canada. Um, these are two rivers um, that Department of Fisheries and Oceans uses as index rivers. So they, they use these rivers to gauge what's happening with the population. And um, as you can see, they have declined significantly. Um, they estimate some of the historic runs. When we say historic, we're talking about in, in you know, the late 70s, 80s, before the, the population really collapsed, of about 40,000 adults um, in about 50 rivers. So there's about 50 rivers in the inner Bay of Fundy. Those 50 rivers would have produced about 40,000 or had about 40,000 adults in them. Now most rivers are completely extirpated. Um, there are a few remnant uh, adults that go into some of these other rivers, but primarily the, most of them are extirpated. Um, so a, a program called Live Gene Banking, which I'll talk about more in a little bit, um, was created to basically avoid extinction altogether. So um, it was kind of the, the last ditch effort to save this um, endangered population. What has caused um, this, this significant, such a significant decline in the inner bay population? Um, marine survival is um, one of the key aspects. It appears to be one of the most limiting factors. Where right now we're seeing less than one percent survival, or less than one percent returns from smolt to adult, um, and that so that is a very big concern. Big question I get all the time. So what is it? What's causing it? Um, are you know are these different predators out there killing all the salmon and is that the cause? Um, I would cautiously say cautiously say no, um, and I say that because predators have been around 
as long as salmon have, and they've coexisted. A big problem now is that we have so few fish out there that any one that is lost, any fish that is lost due to predation or any other means, um, is a significant hit to the popu to the overall salmon population. And so I don't want to say that the, that predators don't play a significant role in in keeping these populations low, um, but I'm not I'm not convinced that they are the ones to blame. Um, I think a lot of times we forget about the last two and a half centuries of impacts that we've created that have also led to the decline of the population such that it's so low that any one fish that is lost becomes a significant significant loss. These are some pictures from um, Fundy National Park um, back in the day when logging was um, a, a very important part of the community, a very important um, economic resource. So on the top right, um, this is the what is now the harbor in, in Alma. And so that would be in the spring when the logs came down, it was a big celebratory event. People gathered around to get their pictures because it was a time of prosperity. Here is our, their income. Just below that, um, this is the logs being driven down the river. This is the upper Salmon River in Fundy National Park as well. And then on the bottom left, that is the sawmill at the mouth of the Point Wolf River. So just out of frame would be the covered bridge. If any of you have been to Funny National Park and walked across or been at the covered bridge on Point Wolf River, um, this is where the mill is. You can see that the dam spanned the entire river, um, as did the dam on the Upper Salmon, um, completely blocking it um, from any salmon being able to ascend it. Uh, that dam wasn't removed until the, in Point Wolf, wasn't removed until the 90s, um, believe it or not. So just to give you a little bit more perspective where these these photos were actually taken from. So you can see the top one again um, from just at that harbor area. And the log, the log drive, um, just just above head of tide on this on where that, that island is, there was that's where the, the, the dam was to the splash dam to hold those logs back. Uh, so again, we you know you look at that that those logs being driven down that river. Those logs are, you know, throughout the entire water column, they'd be scouring the substrate, disturbing the, the eggs that are in there, disturbing the, the fish that are in there, um, as well as those dams completely blocking off, off the river. Now, we don't, we don't do these kinds of um, activities anymore. Most dams have been removed, so we've been able to mitigate those. But I don't think, I think we forget about some of the, you know, what, what these activities had the detrimental effect of these activities on salmon populations and, and their ability to recover from them. Um, fishing um, is another one. This is uh, again from Funny National Park, or I guess just outside on, um, on the flats, um, just on the tide. So this is a, a herring weir. Um, but I, wanted, I pointed out because the fellow on your left who's got the fish in hand and, the, and the, bu the bucket, right in front of him, you can see three Atlantic salmon. So even though they were just targeting herring, or this was a herring weir, in fact, they were taking, they were uh, removing salmon as well as bycatch. I think this is a much more telling photo. Um, this is the Moise River in Quebec. Um, this was a map of the fishing in that river in 1859. Um, so, the, the thing to think about here is, so we have 15,000 fathoms of nets. Um, you know, we're talking about, what is that, 80, 80 kilometers of nets that are being strung. Um, so they've yielded 250 barrels of salmon. That's dried processed salmon. If you do the back calculations, that's about 30,000 salmon that were, that were taken out of the Moise River in 1859. That is a, that is a lot of salmon. Um, that's almost the entire Inner Bay of Fundy population that was removed in one year. Um, and that's, it wasn't just one year, of course, this happened many years in, in consecutively. So there was a significant pressure on, on the salmon population across North America. Um, so I think we need to remember these effects and even though again we've mitigated, we've stopped a lot of these or mitigated for them, um, I think we're still seeing the effects of them with these low numbers and and 
the, um, the population's kind of slow bounce back, if you will. So talking about Inner Bay of Fundy salmon, um, again, numbers uh, more or less collapsed. So what did we do to save them? So again, I, I mentioned the live gene bank. So the Live Gene Bank was an initiative put forth by Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Parks Canada um, in the late 90s when they you know, realized that if something drastic wasn't done, the population would be extra uh, or extinct, I should say. So what they did is they went into a, a, few, um, a few different rivers throughout the Inner Bay of Fundy. So um, in the Big Salmon and uh, Upper Salmon Point Wolf Rivers in New Brunswick, and then the Gaspereau Rivers and um, Stuyak Rivers in Nova Scotia, collected the last kind of remnant smolts as they were leaving the river. These are the last wild fish. Um, because remember, there weren't very many adults coming back then. Um, most of these rivers still only had a handful of fish coming back. So they collected those smolts and took them to different uh, hatchery facilities. This one is in the picture on the bottom is that's the Mactquack Biodiversity Facility. Um, this one holds the, um, the New Brunswick fish, if you will. So they took those smolts and they raised them there to conserve those genetics. So they wanted to keep those wild, inner, unique inner Bay of Fundy genetics alive. And so they would rear them in their conventional way. Um, you know, they would spawn them and then they had various release strategies. They would release them as unfed fry. They'd hold them a little bit longer as, as par. Um, and so, and some of the non-target adults would also be released into the rivers. And so they would, they would do that. And then the following spring, for each spring, they would go back, collect those smolts that they, collect, that they could catch, take them back to the, these facilities. They'd run genetic analysis to see which families they needed to keep. They would keep those for the program, the rest would be released, and that would continue on. And that was the live gene bank, and it's done an amazing job of preserving the Inner Bay of Fundy stock, keeping those genetics alive. Without this program, there would be no Inner Bay of Fundy salmon, and I, so I can't give them enough credit. However, um, we're we still having the same problem that we're not seeing adults return from the sea. So although it's conserved these po this population, it hasn't recovered them. And I think there's a few issues or reasons why that might be. Um, one of them is the importance of early exposure. So if you think of a hatchery environment, it's very artificial. It's these really simple tanks. They don't have a lot, there's not a lot of environmental uh, variability. Um, you, we can put a lot of fish in them and we can make a lot of them survive because we are caring for them. Whereas if you compare that to the wild, you have this very dynamic environment Riffles, runs, pools, rocks, all kinds of um, unique features. The environment is very, um, is dynamic. The densities are much lower, but of course we also have much lower survival um, because it is a, a natural situation. So there is predation and, and everything else. A study by um, Clark et al. in 2016 looked just at this. It wanted to say, okay, um, how, how important um, is this idea of fish seeing a river. How important is being raised in a river versus raised in an artificial tank? And so he looked at this, and so what he, one of the measures was smolt weight. So the larger a smolt, the higher the chance or the better the chance it's going to survive and produce large numbers of viable offspring. So he looked at various release strategies. So releasing, having wild adults, letting them spawn on their own, um, then releasing adults or releasing fry or keeping them a little bit longer and releasing those par. And what he found was that the more wild exposure you have, the, the better the smolts are gonna be are, or the better, more fitness you will have. So the longer you spend in captivity, especially early on as a juvenile, um, the less fitness you're gonna have, life, lifetime fitness. So, Par, having spent the most time in captivity, had the least fitness or the smallest smolt weight, whereas wild adult, wild smolts or smolts from wild adults had the largest smolt weight. So um, the earlier a fish can see the river, the better chance or the better quality it's going to be. Um, so that's one of the things that we were thinking about with this program is how do, 
what's the way to produce the best quality fish possible? Um, still understanding that some captivity has to happen because um, these, these populations need help. But there's another, another, um, another question that I get is, you know, how do we, what's the limiting, most limiting factor to salmon recovery? One of the things I always say is well, there's not enough fish. And I know that seems intuitive, of course, Kurt, if you don't have fish, there's no fish, and we need fish to recover the population. Um, but I want you to think, let's take a look at the map and think about, so we had all these rivers, and if 40,000 adults was that sustainable target, if we had 40,000 adults returning to the Inner Bay of Fundy rivers, um, that was self-sufficient. And that's what kind of one of the recovery goals is. So at a 5% return rate, which I think most people agree is a, is a suitable return rate, a good target to have. Again, we have less than 1%, so we'd be very happy with five, and we see five in other rivers. So if that's the target, we need 800,000 smolts leaving all the Inner Bay of Fundy rivers just to make, maintain that 40,000 adults. So that means the Bay of Fundy consumes 760,000 smolts a year to maintain 40,000 adults. So that's through natural mortality, predation, um, a variety of effects. So if that's what the, if we need 800,000 smolts at a 5% return rate to get 40,000 adults, and collectively all the Inner Bay of Fundy rivers are producing about 50,000 smolts right now annually. And again, most of these are hatchery, which we know has a le less fitness. Um, I don't think it's that surprising that we're not seeing, you know, a lot of these adults return. You know, at 5%, we were okay with understand knowing that, okay, 760,000 smolts are going to die. Um, now we only have, we're only putting 50,000 out. I, I don't think we should be that surprised. And to put it at the current uh, return rate, which is, like I said, less than 1%, we would need 4.6 million smolts to leave the rivers um, in order to get to that 40,000 adults. And currently hatcheries just can't produce that many smolts. There's just not enough space physically. Um, and so putting these two kind of ideas together, we want to produce the best quality fish. And how do we get, how do we produce the most smolts possible if smolt is your target? And I'm not suggesting we release smolts um, because again, we have that early exposure, but how do we get those numbers um, out there, that's where we kind of, that's where our fundy sound recovery strategy or this kind of uh, rearing strategy came about. So it's a little bit of a of a, a path here, and I'll I'll try and walk you through it. So at the very bottom right, um, we have the DFO live gene bank, right? So that was the starting; those are the founding fish. So they were the high ancestry, the most wild genetics that we have to start with. So we, we took those, we spawned them conventionally, and we released fry because we know that the least amount of time a fish sees captivity early on, the better. So fry releases, we could put lots of fry out, they would have some wild exposure, we'd collect those smolts, and then um, instead of taking them back to the hatchery, we took them to a, um, a sea cage, a marine conservation site. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a moment. So we take them to this marine site, we rear, rear them to adult. Once they're mature adults, um, we take them back to their, their river in Fundy National Park, we release them, and now they're allowed to spawn naturally. They have natural mate selection, and they're experiencing the natural environment. Those eggs are now being raised with zero captive exposure. So those eggs that hatch and those fry and, and par that are in that river have never seen captivity. So we collect those smolts as well when they leave and we take them back to the conservation site to be grown to adults. So right now we kind of have these two streams. Um, but as of this spring, we, we hope, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll see. But the, the goal is from now on, we'll only be releasing wild hatch smolts. So the smolts that we're taking to the sea cage will have been completely captive free up until that point. So that's, that's our strategy. That's our kind of our small to adult supplementation strategy. Um, some of you may have heard. So we're collecting these these smolts as they leave the river, taking them to our marine farm where they're uh, 
raised to adult, and then released back into the wild. So like I mentioned, we have this, it's the world's first dedicated marine conservation farm. What does that mean? Well, um, so this is a site, it's on Dark Harbor on Gramanan Island. Um, it is legislated by law through um, Department of Brun or New Brunswick, uh, Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture, as only wild fish can be grown in this harbor, in this site. So it was a commercial site at one point, they decommissioned it, and now through some uh, through legislation, we are allowed to raise our fish here. So no commercial fish can be grown there. Um, our densities are are much lower than commercial pens, and we can't go above those densities. So we can only have 5,000 um, fish of any year class at one given at any given time. Um, and so there's a, there's a number of, of rules and regulations put in place that are unique to growing fish in a conservation setting versus a commercial setting. The nice part about it is we, we have the ability to grow large numbers of fish um, in a protected marine area. So you can see in the background, there's a big seawall. So it's very protected from the ocean. Um, it is connected, so water does move in and out. So um, there is flushing and there is natural prey that comes in there as well. Um, but this was a this was a big big part of this project um, getting this site. Once we got this site, things really started to change uh, for us. So we collect these fish, we take them to the um, conservation farm, and then we have release day. And it is it is a lot of work. It takes a lot of volunteers um, to do this. Um, but it is it is a lot of fun. As you can see, people have a good time. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's a really good thing. These fish travel a long way, so they have to get on a they get in the truck, they take the ferry, then they get trucked from the ferry from from Dar uh, Blacks Harbor all the way to Funny National Park. Once they're there, then we put them in these these blue bins where a helicopter flies them up river because it's a national park. There's not a lot not a lot of road access, and then that helicopter gently lowers the bin into the river where a river crew will then take the lid off and release those fish. So the helicopter is not dumping fish in the river, they're just lowering that bin um, into these areas. So um, since this program started, um, these are the numbers of adults that we released. So in 2015, I just say adults because this was before we got our Dark Harbor site and legislation hadn't changed yet. And so we couldn't keep fish more than one year. And so um, most of those fish were immature. Again, we were still learning, still trying to figure out um, processes and things. Um, after that, 2016, we got the Dark Harbor site. We had legislative change where we can keep fish multiple years. And so uh, we've been able to re release some really large numbers um, into the river. Um, the Upper Salmon River only has about 12 kilometers of accessible salmon habitat. So these, these numbers, are the densities are quite high. So of course we put these fish in, but no program I think um, is you know it, it needs monitoring. Without monitoring, you don't really know what the success of your program is. So we have two kind of monitoring streams: one looking at the salmon um, specifically, salmon population, and the other one looking at larger ecosystem effects. And I'll I'll touch on both. So with with the salmon, we want to look at a number of variables. We want to look at you know. Are they successfully reproducing? What is their survival? What kind of fitness are we, are we getting? So we have a number of different technologies out there to try and answer the questions of, you know, how well are these fish doing? Is this a, is this a worthwhile endeavor? The first one I'll talk about is radio telemetry. So on the left is a, is a, is a radio tag. Um, it has a battery in it. The battery, the life of this tag is, a, is about three years. And so we would surgically implant this, these tags into the body cavity of the fish. Um, then they'd be released when they're released in the river. Then we can go out with these teams of students who go and track the fish. And you can see some Jenna in the middle there does not like tracking. Everyone else thinks it's the greatest thing on the planet. So um, to each their own, I guess. But we can get a lot of information about where exactly these fish are at any given time in the river. 
So the resolution is about a square meter or so within the river. So we really can dial in where these fish are when we go out to, to track these fish. So this is just an example of some of the data that, that we've uh, accumulated tracking these fish. And so the, the rectangle, so the river in the, the, there's the river in the middle, that is the extent of the accessible area for salmon. So at the bottom right of one of those um, triangles, we'll look at panel A, for example, that bottom right, that is kind of the extent of head of tide. And then up at the top, those are two waterfalls. Each branch has a water, an impassable waterfall. And so you can see that um, you know throughout throughout October, fish are really moving throughout the river, kind of finding their way. Um, some some like to hold in the pools, others are really exploring. Um, it is a very new environment to them. But then as time goes on, we start to see them clustering around um, certain areas, and we have now since learned that these are areas of spawning. So not only um, can we see where these fish are, but now we can get an idea of what, what types of habitats they're using to hold in, to rest in, as well as their spawning. Um, and then the, you know, on the far right on panel C, even in December, there's still a few fish um, hanging around the river. Um, typically by the end of December is kind of really when we can stop tracking. Um, most of the fish have left by then, but we do still see a few, a few fish straggling, um, straggling around. Um, I will say that we don't know of any fish overwintering. So we go back out in the early spring to, to, and do a track to see if there's any fish around and we don't find any fish. So um, some point they all do appear to leave the river. So we don't have a large kelp or overwintering component. Another way that we track fish um, is with these passive integrator transponder tags or pit tags. Um, the nice thing about these tags is they're small. They're um, inexpensive. They're only about $2 a tag, whereas those radio tags are about $225 a tag. So where the radio tags tell us where the fish are in the river, kind of, but at an individual level, um, every single fish that we release has a pit tag into it, in it. So we know, now we're getting information about the entire population. The downside is we have to set up uh, stationary antennas and so therefore we only get um, kind of one point in the river what the population is doing, but we still get an idea of what the population is doing. Um, so we inject these, these tags um, directly in the dorsal muscle. So because this is an endangered population and we don't have to worry about um, people angling them and eating them, or at least legally, so we don't have to worry about someone accidentally biting into one of these tags. Um, if it was in a different population where angling was still permitted and retention was allowed, we would have to do it in, into the body cavity. Um, but we can do it directly into the dorsal muscle. It's a little less invasive. And then we can, when these fish are released, we can, we can track them. So like I said, we use, um, the, you have to set up these stationary antennas. And I just put these photos up here to give you an idea. This is kind of the evolution of of our antenna building abilities. Started out literally with some rebar and some wire. We tried some different configurations in the river, out of the river. Um, and really what happens is all those, it didn't matter what we tried, it seemed to get washed away. The Upper Salmon River is a very dynamic river and keeping any kind of equipment in there um, is very challenging. On the right, this is just as the water's receding, Jenna thinks it's the funniest thing in the world that there's a tree stuck in one of our um, piece of equipment in our antenna. She wasn't laughing when I said go get it, but uh, nonetheless, we, we do struggle with this. I can say that uh, this year we were able to build a new antenna. Um, it spans the entire river um, and it's higher than the high water mark and we were able to successfully keep it in the river. Um, although we had some other issues associated with it, this, this antenna design um, seems to be the way to go. And I'll play you a little video of, of um, a student Adora when she was, when they were testing this. This is after many months of trying. The beeps that you're going to hear um, is the antenna picking up the tag. Oh. Let's try that here. Let's 
putting it on and doing a nice video of this thing working. So as you can see, there's really no gaps in the antenna. Doesn't matter, top to bottom, front or back. Um, if a fish comes in, even in high water, it will be detected. Um, so as you can see, they were very, very happy. Um, this was a, they put in a lot of work and they should be uh, commended on, on those efforts. So we can, like I said, we can get a lot of, a lot of really important uh, information from this antenna. So um, on the x-axis, on the left, we have the number of individuals that we detected. The blue line is, is the water level in the river. And then we just have the, the date on the, on the y-axis. Y -axis. And so the different colors are just male and female. This is just to give you an example of, of what kind of data we can uh, generate. So as you can see, um, there's a red line. That, that arrow is the day that we put, that we did the adult releases. So prior to that, um, some of our fish from previous releases did come back and we detected them. So we do have some returning fish, some fish that survived the winter and came back. Um, but you can see throughout the, throughout the fall, um, there's periods and peaks when, uh, you know, large numbers of fish uh, may leave the river. Uh, we do see shortly after the release, a large number of fish leaving. Um, however, the, so that was, there's um, just uh, before October 30th, 30th, you can see a large number of fish leaving up to almost 70 individuals. Um, the, the, num the, the fish that are detected after that, uh, towards the end of October, beginning of November, uh, most of those are those fish returning. So we de even though we see a number of fish leave the river right after release, um, most of them actually come back uh, to, to spawn. So these are just some um, some pictures that I want to talk to you about just for some of the tracking efforts because I think um, just some some neat stories I guess. So on the bottom right, uh, on the snow, um, that was an eagle that that had eaten one of our fish, and the um, the girls found one of the radio tags sitting on the ice. Um, above that, it looks like a, a hole that's a den of some sort. They they tracked a radio tag. Um, almost a kilometer into the woods, um, found it down that hole and bravely, I will say they were very brave. I didn't tell them to do it, but they went and actually stuck their hand down there to pull that tag out and retrieve it. So um, I have to give them a lot of credit for that. Beside that on to the left, to so the top left, um, that's some coyote scat. And in there you might be able to see a little black, the little black pit tag sticking out of there. So this was found by one of the uh, park technicians. Um, literally about two kilometers from any road any trail in the middle of Fundy national park they were um, doing some transect work he happened to look down see the scat and notice that there was a pit tag uh in it so we were able to he brought that tag back we were able to read it um, so we got all kinds of information out of it um, and in the bottom left there you can see an eagle eating a fish uh, some reported an eagle eating a salmon um, so the conservation officer adam went out to take a look. He said, yeah, he found out that it was a salmon. And so he rolled up his pants as only a conservation officer could do and took that salmon from the eagle, brought it back. We, it had a tag in it. We got all the information. It was a female. She had grown 15 centimeters um, over the winter. Um, she was on her way back, likely to spawn. Um, the eagle got her, unfortunately, but that's, that's all part of it. You know, it's a, it is an ecosystem effect. So once we got all that information, he actually took that salmon back to where he found it, and the eagle was still waiting there. It, the eagle came down and got to resume its meal. So um, only, a, only a conservation officer in a national park could harass uh, a, an eagle like that. So another method that we use is um, a Ditson sonar camera. So it's a camera that takes images using sound. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Aris camera that's being used on the mirror machine. Um, this is very similar technology. So, like I mentioned, every fish that we put in has a pit tag, but um, a wild returning fish would not have a tag. And so we wanted to put in a camera to be able to detect um, any wild returns. And so this is just a um, little video of what um, 
a salmon looks like. So on the top, you can see see her swimming by. She goes out of frame, then actually she comes back. That was in fact a wild fish, um, not one of not from our program per se, likely a stray from another river. Um, it was her fourth time returning to spawn, so we were able to age her from the scales, and so um, it was really great to see such a big, healthy fish um, back in the river. And so if, and then the other method we want to look at is we use electrofishing to see, well, that's great. These fish are in there. They're moving around, but are they spawning successfully? And so measuring the juvenile densities is a good measure of spawning success. And so on the top is a map of our electrofishing sites. We had 22 electrofishing sites. Um, we caught fry or the young of the year at every single site that we went to. Um, so from the bottom right up to the top, um, densities were... 2 to 12 or 2 to 11 fry per 100 meters squared, um, which is comparable to some of the densities they were finding in the 80s before the, before the big collapse. Um, with genetic analysis, we were, able to, we were able to find that the adults that returned, so the consecutive spawners, actually contributed more proportionally um, than the, the adults that we just put in. Um, so that was an interesting finding. Again, showing that, that multi seawater component, very important. Um, to producing uh, offspring. And I, I think it's important that this is the only river in the inner bay of Fundy that has um, exclusively wild hatched salmon in it. So there's lots of other rivers that have large numbers of salmon, um, but they have, they're coming from a number of programs. These, these juveniles that are in here have never been in captivity. They came from, they came from eggs that were laid and hatched in the river. And I think that is, um, uh, very important, um, very important to the program. So like I said, so we're looking at the population, the salmon, see what they're doing. But be, this is a, a Parks Canada or part of Parks Canada project. And so they have other mandates. And one of their other mandates is not only um, recovering endangered species, but they have to manage and eat, their, eat the entire ecosystem within the park. And they have to maximize the ecosystem health um, as well. And so Part of the project, part of the work that I'm doing is looking at these ecosystem effects of having adults back in the river. And so, you know, returning salmon are, are a real keystone species to many rivers because they act as ecosystem engineers. And what I mean by that is they do, when they come back, they, they drive processes that increase productivity in the rivers. So how do they do that? So they do that by bringing nutrients, and we call these marine-derived nutrients because as these smolts that are in the ocean grow, they acquire nutrients in the ocean or from the marine environment. And when they come back to river to spawn, they release these nutrients. So through their eggs or the excretory products, or you know, some fish do die, and so their carcasses. Collectively, these are the nutrients that go into the food web, and now they start to drive all these different ecological processes from the slippery algae that we all hate when we're trying to wade across the river to the bugs um, and to the, the juvenile salmon and other resident fishes that are in there. So having fish, having salmon back in the river is important ecologically as much as it is just to have salmon back in the river. And so we want to look, we want to look at these different effects. So the first one is productivity. And so this is a graph looking at the the biofilm, the stuff that is growing on the rocks. And one of the measures we, we to estimate this or to measure how much there is is chlorophyll. So the green, photos, the green photosynthetic, photosynthetic pigment in plants is what we're measuring. The, the pink bars are when um, we know adults to be in the um, spawning in the river. Um, and or in the river, I should say. And then we have a number of sites. And so we have sites in areas where the salmon are, the adult salmon are, and we have a number of sites where there are no adult salmon. And we, what, what I want you to take away from this is that where you have adult salmon, you have much more productivity. So you have much more food at kind of the bottom of the food web. And that's really, that's, you really need that to drive, you know, the whole ecosystem. The other thing I want you to take away from this is look how far it extends out. So we're on the right side of both of those, on the middle and the right graph, you can see that 
the productivity is increased or elevated well into the winter time. Whereas in the spots where they don't have salmon, they follow this kind of general pattern, low productivity in the spring, it goes throughout the summer, then it dies off over winter, and then it usually, in the spring fresh it more or less um, washes it away and it starts over. Um, but where there's adult salmon, there's still nutrients being released through some of the eggs that are dying or some of those carcasses. So productivity remains high into the winter. And so we expect productivity to be high on, you know, in the picture on the left. In the summertime, there's lots of light, um, lots of ability for these plants to grow. But in the winter, when there's snow and, and, and in some cases ice, productivity usually really drops off. But in these areas where there's salmon, it's staying elevated, which means there's more food eventually for salmon um, into these winter months, so helping them get through a tougher time. Um, so I think that's that's really important. That not only are, is it driving productivity, but it's maintaining this high level of productivity well into the winter. So when we have more salmon, we have more biofilm, and that translates to more bugs. So the bugs are the food for the juvenile salmon and other fish as well. So these are just, we collected some from some different nets. Um, but as you can see in the sites that have salmon, there's just a lot more, there's a lot more bugs around than in the areas where there's not salmon. And again, that's because there's more food for the bugs. So if there's more food for the bugs, there's more, you know, they can have more babies and you can have more productivity. Um, so that's, that's great. So we have more productivity at the bottom, more food for the bugs. So we have more bugs and that translates into the fish themselves. So we looked at areas, so in the upper Salmon River where we, these adult salmon are and they're spawning successfully, we looked at those juveniles and we compared them to areas that are stocked traditionally. So they're still, these are still salmon fry that we're looking at, but they don't have those benefits of being around the adults. They don't have those additive, those nutrients that are there. And so what you see is the salmon um, are about, the fry are about two centimeters longer and about four and a half grams heavier when they're in these areas where they where they're exposed to the the adult salmon. So where these marine derived nutrients are, you have much bigger juvenile fish, and that can, that's going to translate into bigger smolts, which is then going to translate into increased fitness. Um, so early on already, we're starting to see these ecosystem effects um, that. Um, you know, we're not seeing in, in other neighboring rivers where we don't have adult salmon. Um, so not only are we starting to, re, you know, the salmon are themselves, we're getting more salmon, but there's also huge ecosystem effects. So we're recovering not only salmon, we're recovering the entire river. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. So what have we accomplished so far? Well, 30-year um, high in adult returns. Um, so last year, we had 70 fish return to that river, to the upper Salmon River. Um, may not seem like a lot, but if you look at that graph, so this is just the number of adults returning. Um, 70 is is fantastic. Uh, you'll see in 2012 there was 40 adults. Yeah, again, that was following um, a pilot project that really led into into the program that we're um, in, uh, running right now. So um, we are very happy to see 70 fish return to the river. What do those fish look like? So this is a look at what those fish um, look like. I'm gonna also point out when I start the video that there's a salmon that has a lamprey attached. Um, so take a look at that. I think that is very important. Um, very interesting. Mm, hope it's gonna work. So there's that, there's that fish with the lamprey. So salmon and lamprey evolved together and so even though we see salmon with scars and we think, oh man, that fish was lucky, you can see that it's it's not swimming any different than the other fish. Um, they evolved together. It really doesn't bother them. That lamprey actually fell off probably about a couple weeks after um, we found that fish again. The scar was there. The lamprey uh, was gone. Um, so these are fish that were released in 2017 and returned on their own in 2018. So I think, um, you know, they're healthy, strong looking, looking fish. So we were very happy to start to see these kind of numbers returning. The other thing I wanna show you right now is you'll see a couple par kind of just coming into screen. Those are one plus par. So those are 
again, you can see how big they are relative to, you know, um, say the other ones, which would have been much, much smaller. So this, pr this program, although it has done, you know, I think we're off to a really good start in terms of recovering salmon, um, is more than just, just salmon. There's all kinds of other conservation research that has come about. Um, we've been in McLean's and Canadian Geographic. We had a documentary um, called Striking Balance. Um, this, the, the release is also an event. Um, Penacodiac River, Fort Folly First Nations. Um, I can't say enough about the work that they're doing there. Um, so they're, they're essentially taking this model, this approach, and applying it to the Petacodiac River. Um, this year, they will have their biggest release ever. Um, the numbers are looking um, comparable to what we've been releasing, if not even more. Um, so they're a really dedicated group of people that are doing amazing work on the Petacodiac. Because again, that, that river accounted for about 25% of salmon habitat. So if we can get that river up and running, I think that's a really good start. The other one is the Law Enforcement Coalition. Salmon don't follow normal boundaries, of course. They don't just stay in one river. Um, so the wardens in Funding National Park figured this out early on and said, hey, we need to talk to the other, other law enforcement agencies. So there's Parks Canada wardens, Department of Fisheries and Oceans officers, Environment Canada officers, um, Department of Natural Resources officers, off-road vehicle officers, RCMP officers, and um, Crime Stoppers all got together to form this coalition. And it, it has won awards all over the world, um, down in the US, South Africa, Europe. It is an amazing example of getting interdepartmental agencies together on a common goal and on a common um, mission. And so they routinely do patrols in each other's jurisdictions. They come and help out with the releases. They are an integral part of this program. Um, I think it's just a great example of what, what can be accomplished by simply just picking up a phone and starting to talk. Um, they, they deserve all the accolades for all the awards that they've won. The other thing that the, this program has done is trying to connect people with salmon again. Um, unlike other rivers where people can go out and angle and you can make that connection, there's no angling of, of these salmon because they're an endangered species. So, started a program called Swim with the Salmon. Um, and that's the one that's done in the fall. In the summer, we have some citizen science programs. Um, in the spring, we run a salmon research open house. Um, the one that I'm mostly involved with is this Swim with Salmon. And that's where we take people in small groups and teach them about, the, about salmon, about recovery. Um, we teach them about the different scientific methods that, that we use for monitoring, like snorkel surveys. And then they actually get to go out, do a survey with us, and they get to see these, these fish in their natural environment. And being able to go out and see a wild, return, wild returning Atlantic salmon um, is, is a pretty amazing, you know, it's a pretty amazing feeling. And, and everyone comes away with, with um, such an appreciation for these, these animals, for the program. Um, I think it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. So again, this is a huge collaborative effort. Um, there's, there's so many partners involved. Um, Parks Canada, Fisheries and Oceans, Atlanta Canada Fish Farmers Association, um, Village of Graham and Ann, the University Cook Aquaculture. Um, they're the ones that grow our fish in, in Dark Harbor. Um, Fort Folly First Nations, the province, and of course, the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation for, again, for funding much of our work. So this, this last little video that I want to show you, um, it was just after our release in 2017 um, in one of the pools in the upper stretch of the salmon. Um, I think it's a great example of what these rivers should have, would have looked like, you know, back in the day before, before the populations collapsed. So this was just after we put all these fish in the river. Um, being able, having the opportunity to, to go and swim with these fish and swim over top of them see them back in the river where they're supposed to be um, is, was, it's amazing feeling. Um, I, would, I would highly recommend people wanting to sign up for the Swim with Salmon to do, to do that because being able to see these fish um, in their natural environment is, is truly special. And with that, I will thank you for your time and be happy to take any questions that you may have. 
Thank you so much, Kurt. That was an excellent overview of your research and of the program. It was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so as Kurt said, we're going to open the floor now to, for our question and answer session. So you've got a couple of options with your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box you should be seeing in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Um, so if you're using the audio of your computer, you can figuratively raise your hand, which is the little hand icon. Um, I'll unmute your microphone and you can ask your question directly to Kurt, or you also have the option of typing in your question on the control panel and we'll read it aloud for you. So it looks like we've already got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is from, and I apologize, I'm probably mispronouncing the name, Ios Manga. Um, the question is, given the migratory isolation of the Fundy populations, um, are they not reproductively isolated sufficiently to be considered a separate species? Was the migratory isolation a known factor before the population collapse, or is it a recently acquired behavioral trait? Sorry about the naive question. I'm just an interested Westerner. Um, that's a great question. So um, it has been known for, for a long time prior to the population collapse. Um, there's been a no number of studies um, for, uh, on their migration as well as genetic studies that show that they are a genetically distinct population. Um, and I think because because of that distinction, that was some of the impetus for, for you know, really um, starting that live gene bank to conserve those unique genetics. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, he has a follow-up question, and Denise Buckley asks a related question, which is, what is the density of the smolts and the net pens at the start of the project? Um, that's a great that's a great question. So it really depends on how many smolts that we can get. Um, so this year will be our first really big um, wild smolt run, um, but we've been taking over about 1,500 smolts from our um, kind of through that live gene bank avenue, depending on the year, but, you know, but that's kind of roughly what we've been starting with um, each year. So the net pens are unique in that we can adjust the density. So as we start to put more fish in, as our program grows, um, we can lower that that net to, inc to, to maximize the density to initiate feeding. So, but um, yeah, we won't, we don't, None of our pens will hold more than a couple thousand fish at a time, unlike a commercial pen, which can hold, you know, 10,000 or more, for example. Thank you. Uh, so Denise Buckley has a follow up question. Are you using antibiotics, sea lice treatments? Is there ISAV monitoring? So it's a great question. So we don't use antibiotics. Um, there is all the health monitoring that goes on in whether it's at the you know the biodiversity facility or in commercial aquaculture. So every any mortality gets tested, um, as well as throughout the year growing, there are random collections for health testing as well. So they are, um, and I should have mentioned that. Um, so before they get moved from the river to the sea cage, sea, uh, to the sea cage site, they get health tested. Um, they're health tested throughout their their term in Dark Harbor. And then before you move them back, they're also health tested to make sure that they don't have any, um, any infections or anything like that. Um, sea lice, they do get treated. Um, it is a very painstaking operation because we pick them all by hand. Um, our numbers are, are low enough, I guess, um, but we go out uh, usually about three times a year, depending on um, densities. Um, but typically we find that uh, we go out in the spring and then that will carry us through in about April. That carries us through till July, somewhere uh, beginning of August. Um, we pick them then and then we do again um, uh, that depending on that we'll either do it then or in October. But yes, so we actually pick them off by hand so they don't get uh, chemical treatments or anything like that. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Colin Murray. Uh, he wrote, thank you. This was a super interesting topic and presentation. Thanks. Is the reason you went through the work and cost of releasing adults by helicopter and ferry rather than eyed egg planting because of the nutrient effects that adult salmon have on the ecosystem? Or are there other reasons as well? Is there much of a trade-off between the two with respect to fitness? Um. So I would say there's a little bit, there would be a little bit of a trade-off to fitness for the simple fact that the, um, by releasing adults, you get natural mate selection. Um, 
So they can pick mates far better than I could ever even imagine. I mean, I've worked in hatcheries and we know there's a female, there's a male, we mate them, but we know that there is mate selection in the wild. Um, the logistics of, of planting um, eggs is very challenging. I have done it both um, in the Tobik system and in the Miramichi system for various projects um, with some success, um, but it is, it is very challenging. Um, we've always done it, we did it with, um, green eggs so basically we had to time it in, in that you know that 48 hour window after they're fertilized is when we put them out the challenge of putting eyed eggs out is finding suitable habitat that's open in, in, in that time of year so typically in January February now when you have those eyed eggs um, the rivers are usually frozen over and so the only open places are places that aren't the best habitat for the eggs so here it's a it's a it's a challenge to get those those eggs out at that time of year, um, but you're right it is it is expensive to have to helicopter to have to helicopter fish in. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Louise de Messal Strau. Uh, thank you for the talk. Could you speak more about the mechanisms through which adult salmon bring nutrients into freshwater, influence the freshwater productivity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I could talk about that for days. That was my and that was what my PhD was actually about. So when these juvenile fish go, and I'm, I'll say juvenile fish because it's really any anadromous fish um, has the same mechanism. So the juveniles go to the ocean and as they're growing, they're acquiring nutrients, right? They're, they're eating. And so because they're eating at the buffet, they're putting on weight, just like I would if I go to a big buffet. Um, so when they come back to the freshwater to spawn, they're not feeding. So they're only releasing nutrients. So as the adults come in, they're spending some length of time in fresh water. So they're excreting, they're peeing and pooping in the water. Those nutrients are, are taken up almost immediately by those, that biofilm, by that, those plants. Um, so there's that mechanism. The eggs that are deposited um, are food for the invertebrates. They can eat them directly or the ones that aren't, that either aren't fertilized or don't develop for whatever reason will eventually break down and release those nutrients. When I'm talking about nutrients, I'm really talking about you know nitrogen and phosphorus and carbon, um, the kind of the building blocks um, for a lot of these ecological processes. And then of course um, some of the adults don't survive, so though their carcasses um, will also break down um, to release nutrients as well as other invertebrates and fish will feed on them. And so those nutrients um, get into the food web and that's what really drives the productivity. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Wayne, I wanna say Watney, um, who has his hand up, so I'll unmute his microphone. Wayne, can you hear us? Yes. Great. Oh. Um, can you ask your question? Okay, I have two questions. The first question is, have you determined what is limiting the marine survival? <laughs> um, no, I, that is something I would like to get into. Um, it is something we are, well, I, we are getting into, I shouldn't say like to, we are. We have a couple of projects that we're starting um, this, this spring or this summer um, to start to at least get some understanding of what's going on, but we have no idea. Um, okay. I think it's a multi. I think it's it's not one thing. I think it's that death by a thousand cuts kind of thing. Um, very few fish. So when you have so little, so such a small population, everything is a is a big issue. Yes, yes, I see that. I'm impressed with your work. I work on the west coast. And one well, thing I, I was fascinated by your findings on the um, marine derived nutrients. Mm -hmm. and, out here on the west coast with our fish obviously they they die when they return um yeah. have, have you considered working with the farm fish industry to take the guts and stuff like that sterilize them and then and then use those to enhance the stream um we've talked about it um there's i think especially in the park there's some issues with optics um, okay. It's a natural, you know, it's a pristine area. Um, however, we have done some uh, experiments in the past using fertilizers to do just okay. that, um, and with some with some success. Um, but yes, we have we have talked about using um, carcasses and things like that to um, 
especially outside the park, if we can start to expand this program to help kickstart some of those rivers. Yes, but I know that it's, they've had lots of success on the on the West Coast with that. Yes, and one of the things that I believe they're doing in BC, I'm from Washington State, but in BC, I believe they're actually turning the feed or, or the carcasses into pellet form so that it's not a visual distraction. Yeah, the, the carcass analogs. Um, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you that. for your presentation. I would like to um, get a hold of you outside of this and see if I can get a copy of that. Yes, I'm absolutely. fascinated by it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. I've got to go back to my other job. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so our next question comes from Casey Clark, who asks, "What do you estimate is the percent of the released fish that successfully spawn, either total number or number of females?" Uh, so. Um, we are trying to get at that right now. So our first estimate, um, so we were able to, so from that 2017 electrofishing data, we collected just over 300 or about 300 individuals, which represented about 35% of the population. Now, I think the caveat in there is that's about as good as we can get at that point because we, we released um, 900 or so fish so to get a, a true estimate of the total spawning population, we would have had to collect at least that many, um, or at least half that many, I guess. If, we, if, every, if every fish spawned successfully, then the minimum number that we could collect to even get at that would be 450. So um, when I say about 35%, um, that's of what we collected. So I think, that's, I think it, it's, it's really good. I'm, I would expect it to be higher than that, but we don't know. We're going to try and supplement those numbers with our, our smolts this year to see if we can get a better estimate. So we'll hopefully understand that um, after this year. Great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Sean Ledwin. Um, Sean, uh, are you there? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I was curious. Um, it's if you, when you get when you collect brood stock, it looks like you guys use the rotary screw traps and are collecting smolts. And I, my understanding was you guys also potentially collect uh, large par through electrofishing. Yep. And um, I guess I was just curious what the process was to sort of condition or transport those fish to the sea pens, and if you had any kind of lessons learned there. Yeah. Then, question if you have time yeah yeah so um for the smolts we are um so we collect them in the rotary screw trap we catch about it's about a 10 percent efficiency um i guess I'll, i will say that um and they go they get trucked directly to the sea cages so um we collect them they go into a holding bin for a day or two when we get enough then we truck them directly and put them in the sea cages um to supplement our program, because like I said, we, this will be our first year of our really big, of a true smolt run, I guess. Um, we go out into the other rivers that, the, that are being supplemented, uh, collect the large fall par, um, and then they actually go to the hatchery, spend the winter there, and then they get trucked to Grand Manan. So, um, but hopefully after this year, we can get away from that and it'll only be the wild produced smolts. Um, we're still working on the best way to do it. Um, we've been playing around a little bit with um, mixing, um, instead of trucking them in direct in fresh water, uh, a mixture of fresh and sea water to help them kind of acclimate. Um, that seems to help. The biggest thing is is getting them onto feed when we get to the to the cage site, um, and they've been doing a, a great job of of you know cha changing that process to maximize um, survival. Okay, great. Um, and it, sort of a related question. Um, it sounds like you guys source um, some of your brood stock from other rivers. Nope. If you were, you know, if you when you were getting started. Um, so, yeah. So, sorry. Go ahead. Fish from from the hatchery, and um, uh, you know, we we are um, in the state of Maine, uh, contemplating and have a proposal to do a similar project in the Penobscot River. Yep. 
branch. And um, I think our initial, uh, you know, brood stock source would be from a, a federal U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service hatchery. Yep. Where we would essentially just use smolts that they've reared um, that are their origin is from, um, you know, sea run adults that were collected. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then eventually, once we have enough fish in the river, we'd probably go along a similar line that you guys have are doing. So I was curious, um, you know, given that those fish wouldn't have reared uh, in and imprinted to that particular habitat that we were going to release them in. Mm-hmm. If you had any thoughts on um, maybe from some of the other fish you've collected from other rivers, like if those fish tend to behave similarly, you know, spawn at a similar rate or tend to leave more readily or if any, yeah. any insights to that would be helpful. Sure. So um, I will say, so the live gene bank collected fish from multiple rivers, but our fish all originated from the park initially so they were i guess as imprinted to the park as best we could um but in the past they have we have tried you know there were some fish that had essentially some adults that had never seen the river um and they did spawn successfully um but not not as successful for so um for example it was typically for every adult that we put in we would collect one smolt um, now that would represent 10 smolts leaving, about a 10% efficiency, but that was the general kind of return for every hatchery raised adult. So these are adults that had never even left the hatchery. Um, we would get about one um, for every adult. Now um, we're seeing on average um, from some of the other experiments and some of the early work, we were getting um, on average four um, smolts per adult. Um, and we had one individual that um, we estimated um, produced um, 75 smolts. Um, we caught, uh, did we catch 25 of her smolts um, throughout the entire run? So it wasn't like one day. Um, so we are seeing a better smolt return, if you will, um, the more exposure they get to the wild. But yeah, I mean, my recommendation is whatever you got start with um it may take a little bit longer to prime the pump but it'll come um they do they will spawn and they will produce offspring and those offspring that they produce will be of high quality because they have never seen that captivity so um yeah i think it's great Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Claudie Lachance, Lachance um, who asks, we know that fish behavior can influence their fitness and that aquaculture can reduce behavioral diversity despite fish having a great genetic diversity. Have you um, assessed or thought about assessing salmon behavioral diversity, for example, temerity, aggressivity, movement behavior, etc.? cetera? Um, not in the cages themselves. Um, but we are um, currently working on some of that work now to see. So early, like I said, so early on, uh, I guess to go back to the previous question, we did have fish that kind of originated from various streams of collection. Um, one being completely from the hatchery, um, as well as kind of various uh, permutations of that. And so we're able to, because we have all the tags and some of the telemetry work. We're trying to piece that together now to see um, if they behaved or how much they differently they may have behaved. Um, so I don't know that question hope, or the answer directly, but I'm hoping to have some answers shortly. But yes, um, we are trying to minimize a lot of those um, domestication effects um, at our at our cage site. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Stephen Booth, who asks, "Does this program differ from the?" program proposed for the Miramichi? If so, how? Um, yeah, I think there's a number of differences. Um, one, the, I think the biggest one is, um, you know, our population is endangered. Um, if we didn't do anything, there would be no fish. So the risk of not doing something is extinction. Um, yes, the, the numbers in the Miramichi are, are low. 
um, but there are some fish there. Um, so that's, I think that's one difference. Um, the other big difference um, is we have, because we're in the Bay of Fundy and aquaculture is there, we can use um, a marine rearing site, whereas the cast, the Mona and the Miramichi are gonna be rearing their dwarf smolts in fresh water. Um, and we don't know if any, if that has an effect or not. Um, we just, I, the, previously the only hatchery that we had uh, access to was the Mactaquac one, and they are just not equipped to be raising large numbers of adults for us. So this was a way to, for us to grow large numbers of adults. So those are, I think, are the two biggest differences. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Robert Vadis Jr., uh, who asks, given the pending reductions of Atlantic salmon sea pen operations in the Pacific Northwest to save native salmon species, uh, native salmonid species, excuse me, might uh, similar efforts in Atlantic Canada have any benefit for inner fundy salmon? Um, I guess I haven't seen enough evidence to say that there is a direct cause to the decline of Atlantic salmon with the emergence of aquaculture. Um, yes, there are, you know, there are definitely documented negative effects that in the past, um, I think they, you know, there's some mitigative efforts to, to uh, stop those. And, um, you know, if it wasn't, if it wasn't for aquaculture, we wouldn't be able to do this project here. Um, so, you know, aquaculture is not going away here. I don't see in the foreseeable future. It's a, it's a, you know, makes a lot of revenue for the, the province. And so, you know, if we can work with them to help um, recover a species, then I think that's, that's the, the way we're going to, a good way to go for sure. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Casey Clark, who asks, what is the mortality of smolt uh, to adults in the net pens? Um, it varies. Um, we've had, um, you know, some really, really, we've had some good years um, where we have, you know, 80% survival. Um, and we've had, you know, years where we've had 60 or less percent survival. Um, we don't know what's why one year is better than the, the other. We're still still working on that. Um, but we have been in, increasing our survival rates each year. So it, it is a learning process for us as well. Great, thank you. Uh, next question comes from Mike Hunka, who asks, are the wild raised salmon imprinting on the rivers within Fundy National Park where they are released, or are they being found in other rivers within the region through your telemetry surveys? So we have done some extensive telemetry work outside the park, and we have not found um, any salmon in any other rivers, um, as well as there's monitoring programs on a number of rivers outside the park, which they have also not found um, any of our salmon. However, we have seen some of our salmon return to a couple of the smaller rivers um, within Fundy National Park. So um, from what we can tell, they are pretty fidelic to Fundy National Park. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, William Daniels asks, uh, is the carrying capacity of the river known? If so, how does the current population compare? Um, so the conservation, um, the viable conservation number, I believe is 80, or that's the minimum number, um, is 80. The estimates from the 1960s were about a thousand salmon um, in the river uh, returning. And if you go back to some historical documents from you know 17, 1800s, um, there's talk of you know greater than 2,000 salmon being taken from that river. Um, so I think when we're you know when we're at this 1,000, 1,200 fish, I think we're right in that ballpark of of you know. A, a realistic number for that river. But I think it could hold a lot of fish, for sure. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Joshua Royt. Um, the Inner Bay of Fundy life history uh, is 
a safer bet than that of the Greenland stocks that migrate to Maine's River, which have such high sea mortality and are at risk of local extirpation. What do you think are the biological or ethical impacts bringing these fundy life history fish into Maine rivers? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I guess, you know, the, the, since these fish kind of evolved in this inner bay region, um, I don't know if they would necessarily either be the best suited or if you want to start mixing those genetic stocks. So there is all, you know, when you start mixing genetic stocks, there's also, there's always a possibility of, um, you know, something that doesn't really know what to do. It, you know, may take a little bit, say, from one and be like, well, I'm not going to leave the fund, the, this area, and the other ones want to go somewhere and it may just go part way. Um, that's just a, a, you know, a hypothetical example, but um, it could happen. So, um, mixing genetic stocks with very different life history strategies, I think, is risky. Um, mixing river stocks or genetic stocks, if you will, with similar life history strategies is less risky. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Connie Dobbin Vincent, uh, who asks, I noticed that the Fundy National Park release numbers were lower in 2018 than in 2016 and 2017. Was there a reason for this? Excellent presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so really it's, it's uh, mostly just trying to um, get the numbers of fish. Um, so because we're still early on and still really trying to ramp up um, numbers of, and production, if you will, it's just it, right now we're limited by the number of fish that we can collect. Um, so this year we're hoping that we're going to have a really good small run. The uh, electrofishing surveys suggest that we will. Um, and so we're hoping that those numbers will even increase more. So it's really just a matter of what we can get our hands on. And until we can get that pump going, I guess. Okay, thank you. Uh, Justin Stevens asks, um, I may have missed it, but are the adults reared in the sea pens for one or two years? What are the average uh, weight when they are released to spawn? And he also says, great talk, Kurt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we are allowed to hold fish over more than one year. Um, that was a, probably the biggest hurdle um, in the legislation. And so we some are, some are held for one year, so they're released as a one sea winter. Um, and the ones that don't mature after one sea winter um, get released um, in their second year, regardless if they're mature. But um, at that point, they're probably 98%, 98% of them are mature anyway. Um, we're trying to get to, uh, you know, because the inner bay was primarily a, a one sea winter population, we're trying to get that ratio up, but we're at about, um, 40% one sea winter, 60% two sea winter, and that varies. Um, the average weight of the fish that are releasing are about four kilograms. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we've got our last question here from Sarah uh, Leinhardt, who um, asks, I assume that the ultimate goal of the project will be to create a self-sustaining population. How many years do you plan to continue this work? At what number of returns would you consider the population self-sustaining? Um, that's a good question. Um, so right now, I mean, the problem is I don't think one river will, re will recover the entire inner Bay of Fundy pop salmon population. So I think, we need to bring other rivers on board. Um, but if we started to get, you know, over a hundred salmon returning every year, um, I think we'd be well on our way to being self-sustaining given that they say the minimum viable, minimum, minimum population is about 80. Um, but I'd like to see more than that, but um, we're gonna keep going as, as long as we can to help, help recover this population. Great, thank you. 
Um, so that was our last question. So again, a huge thank you to Kurt for today's presentation um, and to everybody uh, who participated today. Um, a little reminder that the next webinar will be on February 27th. Uh, Dr. Julien April will be speaking about follow-up and research work um, by the Quebec Department of Forests, Wildlife and Parks for Atlantic Salmon Management. The webinar itself will be in French, but the question and answer period will uh, be uh, bilingual. This webinar, the upcoming one on, the, on February 27th, is going to be the, our last of this season before we restart again in September. So if you have any suggestions for topics or speakers, I'd be really happy to have them. So a huge thank you to Kurt and for everybody to participating today, and we hope you can join us all again very soon. Thank you. Thanks so much.